Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm super excited on this episode of Coaches, Fighters, and Fathers to uh, connect again with uh, Adam Lorenz. Adam, great to see you, my friend, who is a fighter, who is a coach, who is a father, uh, and uh, who's just opened up his uh, psychologist practice. So we're in his office right now, so I'm pretty sure he's going to be billing me by the hour. So we might have to keep <laughs> this a little bit. So, but Adam, how are you, my friend? I'm doing very well, thank you. Good to How hear. Uh, yeah, very good, very good. I was doing some prep for uh, for our for our discussion around sort of coaching and fighting and fatherhood, and uh, I I forgot because we worked together on MFC for so long. Uh, that's an event that we had in Saskatoon. The first one's a sellout that you guys did an incredible job of promoting. Um, but I I went back and took a look at your fight with Matt Jelly from BC. <laughs> That you had at, at Saturday Night Fights, I think thirteen and uh, or, or twelve, and it was just awesome, dude. So, talk to me a little bit about um, your journey into the martial arts first. You know where where you sort of came from, how you went from, you know, from civilian to fighter, and uh, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those highlights, and we'll go from there. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. I I've watched that fight a few times myself, actually. <laughs> I, I always say if anyone contacts me and they want me to be on a future card again sometime, if they can find someone that'll have a fight like that with me, I'm down because I, I seriously, it was, it was, it lasted one round, but it was quite a blast. And yeah, uh, Matt, Matt Jelly's a tough kid and, yeah. uh, and he wanted to test your shots and he was asking for it. And man, you, you, uh, you had some great head movement, and yeah, what I might get Kelly to do is uh, actually pull it out uh, and put it on just after this, uh, so people can see what we're talking about because it is <laughs> it is super entertaining to watch, and uh, yeah, <laughs> you, uh, yeah, yeah, I felt that one for a while. Anyways, <laughs> I think we both felt that one for a while. But yeah, as far as people getting into martial arts journey, I know a lot of people get involved with the sport because you know they've seen it on TV and you know stuff like that, and. Um, and for myself, I did, you know, I watched it on, you know, the the pride days and the early UFC days and all that cool stuff. And I remember watching as a teenager, but I grew up in a small town that was a couple of hours out of the out of Saskatoon. It was an hour out of Regina, but it was still a small town that didn't have any martial arts in it. It's called Raymore, Saskatchewan. And as a kid, I was like this huge WWF fan and it's WWE now, but I loved it. It was all like you, you came out to the ring with your entrance and, and there's the crowd and they did all their stuff and they had certain moves that they liked and other people maybe didn't do. And, and MMA kind of was like that too. Like we had like these Vanderlei Silvas and Joaquin Hansen's and the So I remember I was like, oh man, I want to do jujitsu one day like Nagara because he's triangling these big guys and Vanderlei was using Muay Thai and I was like, how cool is this? Right. And and kind of put it all together but you know what it never like happened for you know through school um like my school days uh so then later i moved to saskatoon um when i was 18 to go to university so i was doing my first degree at that time and uh i st i thought about joining but then you know there was i was busy with things there was school and my was like i had a girlfriend back home and stuff like that so i was going back and forth on weekends and stuff like that but uh um, for myself, because I know you said you want me to share a little bit of my story, is uh, on May 15 of 2005, my best friend slash cousin slash older brother slash roommate, um, the person that, um, well, I, where I was, I was babysat as a child and both my parents worked. And so I always went to my auntie's house and the youngest of the three brothers there, his name was Wesley. And so that was like my, kind of like my big brother. And the reason I moved to Saskatoon, he passed away May 15th of 2005. And so I was like, just turned 20 years old. And then I became single in August, it's like a couple, a couple months later. So there was, I was a, a young 20 year old man that had, you know, no one in the city kind of anymore. And, uh, I read an article on, on Sherdog, I think it was Sherdog.com said that there's a guy named Jason St. Louis was in Saskatoon. And I was like, Oh wow. He fought like David the Crow Lawazo. And like, I'm going to go check that out. And so the first gym I went to was, well, it was in September of 2005. So I kind of had a couple of rough things happen that year. And then I started training in martial arts and uh, I can't remember how long he was here for, but he was like my first coach. And then from there, uh, um, the gym kept going after him uh, for the next, you know, 10 years. And well, it's still going, that gym's still going, but uh, 
myself and some of my best friends and training partners started our own gym in 2014. So it kind of all went from difficult, difficult year, difficult spring, a difficult summer. And then the fall of 05, I started and I just went with it. And talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about that. Um, whenever I was doing research in university on, on high performance athletes in in sports where pain is um, not just injury, but significant pain could be there. I found that in powerlifters and in 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 fighters, boxers, or martial artists, there was often um, there was often uh, some trauma. Not necessarily trauma, but you know what I mean. You're a psychologist, so you know as well. But there was some sort of trigger that it was almost like they had this negative energy. And this either it was sadness or his disappointment or his frustration. You talk about guys like Adam Wayne, you know, losing his parents. You talk about um, Cormier losing his daughter, and and how they're able to focus that energy into training. Would you say that sort of happened after you lose a girlfriend, and then of course the passing of your friend Wesley? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, well, possibly uh, because I do think that when you have something that is such a big deal, and then you find something that helps you cope with that. And, you know, and it makes, you know, it becomes the place that you like to be at, then, you know, you can't help but train there a lot. Like, I remember it was like, okay, well, wow, I found something I love to do. And I've always wanted to do like, I remember for years, I wanted to, you know, do wrestling. Like, I remember I was like, Oh, I wish I was in like wrestling. And I'd read like wrestling books from like the library. And I wish I would have started wrestling as a kid that sure would have helped for my MMA career. Um, but then, uh, so I could see where that would that would help because if just like I tell people all the time, they'll be like, when I'm mad or something, I don't feel like getting into a fight or when I'm sad, like fighting is something I do that like it's a happy time. <laughs> you know, my happy my happy place is being at the gym with all the people that I like and we fight. Some people are like, oh, hard day, you know, like um, for instance, something happened just now. Um, so I don't I can't call myself a psychologist just yet because I'm waiting on my provisional number. So I'm a therapist or a counselor and any day now I thought for the last you know months I've been waiting for this provisional number and I just found out today that they didn't have the meeting look at my file today like I thought they're going to um it's gonna wait till next month so then I just finished telling someone like oh it looks like I'm gonna have to wait another month and they're like oh I feel sorry for your sparring partners or training partners and I was like yeah kind of and I'm thinking well I'm not gonna fight them any different now because when I go to the gym I'm not going to be like in my mad spots and wanting to hit people. I'm actually just having fun and, and, you know, doing what I like to do. So I can see where that would be helpful because if you're using this aggression, you know, it seems aggression was aggressive sport and, and there's, there's pain tolerance involved and stuff. I have like eight things that hurt on me right now and I'm not even training for a fight right now, but other guys are. And, um, so I can see where if you take all that and then you move it into somewhere that you're having a lot of fun, it's just gonna match up that way yeah yeah that's good i mean that's a i think that that's a real important thing in order for you to, to get through um injuries or to get through pain you gotta love what you gotta do right you gotta love what you what you're doing otherwise it's more like a job right instead of uh talk to me a little bit about um you're the one of the main coach head coaches and owners of um Modern Martial Arts Center in Saskatoon. Um, how did that come about? Talk to me a little bit about sort of how the the obstacles that might have put you in the, when you decided to open that, and what were some of the things that you had to overcome uh, to start your gym, Adam? Okay, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, you know, when you're when you're part of like a a community, right? You kind of like you get associated with people, and and you're loving it, and you just sort of like even if you're not progressing personally, like, you know, like maybe your martial arts skills aren't progressing, you have to, you know, try to become self-aware and self-reflect and see, you know, are, you know, how are things going? And I don't know, it's just for, for myself and the guys that opened my gym with, um, we just felt like we needed to move on to, you know, get some affiliations with, like I have a couple of, a couple of black belt coaches in Regina now. And then I have, you know, Dwayne Ludwig, who's uh, amazing. Uh, so we're doing the BMT thing and we just thought that we needed some sort of uh, structure and like high level guys to help us progress. And uh, 
we just thought we'd have to keep getting better. So when we look back and we were kind of, you know, guys were starting to get submitted in fights and stuff like that. And we just thought that, you know, like maybe our, our time in that kind of area was kind of over and like, we did pretty well up until then. Right. Um, I know like between Kurt and, and Tyson, like Kurt, uh, Kurt Southern, Tyson Steele and, and myself and some of the other guys, we'd picked up some wins and some big wins and stuff like that, but we kind of weren't as much anymore. And, you know, kind of looking back, we were kind of like, I don't know if we're, we're, getting a whole lot better anymore. And, you know, it was probably time that we started raising up some of these young guys and being coaches ourselves as well. I don't know if originally we had that in mind. We're kind of like, let's get together and give me, you know, awesome guys and kind of one spot and get all this knowledge and, and travel and bring it back because we were doing some of that. So Coach Kurtz, like traveling down to see Dwayne Ludwig all the time. And we got guys just going to various camps, whether they're going to like Lovato's camp or wherever they're going. And now we have other guys joining up with us that have come from other gyms as well who are competing all the time in jiu-jitsu and all these young guys that are fighting amateur and now just entering into pro MMA. And before you know it, it just sort of kept building and building and building where we just got a more and more solid kind of team put together, but kind of all based on the way that us as veteran, you know, us as veteran, like as fighters and guys that have been training for many years, is, you know, we kind of get to bring everyone together kind of under the umbrella that we thought would help them all kind of develop. And I'm just super thankful. Like, I think um, I wish I was starting to, like, I started late. Like, I started at 20 years old. I started training martial arts. Mm-hmm. I've still been doing it for 13 years, right, in jiu-jitsu and Muay Thai. But I think back, um, you know, seeing these young guys at our gym, like, we got, you know, 12-year-old, 13-year-old kids that look amazing. And, and I'm like, man, you guys have it really lucky, lucky because, like, I wish I was, you know, 20 years younger, even 10 years younger, training under Kurt Southern and Tyson Steele and the other guys because we have, you know, eight or nine coaches now uh, yeah. all together. Yeah, and, I mean, I've talked to a few of those guys, and they're all class acts. It's a great group of guys. Um, I love all of them. And, and it's important um, to talk about the evolution of the sport. I mean, when you when you take a look at it, MMA – continues to evolve at this strange level where you still see new new things happen in in the pro shows even in the in the other shows in grappling events um i think you you've got the right mentality uh around that you i mean it's just always about hey listen we just come here to compete we came here to dominate in order to dominate you have to be able to innovate faster than people can imitate you kind of thing right mm-hmm. um talk to me a little bit about having kids and uh how you balance the uh the workload of you being a psychotherapist psychologist next month um and a coach and an owner and uh and being a father yeah well and plus i was also in grad school for a few years <laughs> oh yeah that thing grad school <laughs> and i'm thinking in my head like you know what it, it wasn't easy like there was a lot of I finally, I never drunk, you know, I drank coffee zero times in my entire life until grad school started. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm working a full-time job and I'm doing grad school. And we just opened this gym that I have to like be responsible for. And we had a newborn baby and now we have two kids now. We have an 11 month old and a four year old, but we kind of did it all at the same time. I remember like I had like a three month old at home and I started grad school and a full-time job and the gym opened all like this in September of 2014. It was like, let's do all these things at once. And I think it taught me, it taught me how much you can handle. Like, you know, if you're sleeping, you know, three hours a night for days at a time, but you're getting all this stuff done, doing homework until two in the morning and then waking up early to get to work. And it did teach me now that when I am feeling a little overwhelmed that, you know, what I've done harder before, um, but also you need people you can rely on. Absolutely. I would never, ever, ever, because like, I'll be perfectly honest if my wife wasn't taking care of the the kids so much like during not just on that mat leave but then when she went back to work full-time and now on this other mat leave that is almost over um like well yeah it just ended kind of today she went back part-time she starts june 1st again full-time when the baby turns 12 months so she has like done all sort of all the kids stuff like way way higher percentage than i have on like the waking up at night because while i was staying up really late and getting up really early. Um, so the little bits of sleep I could get, she let me have, right? And then when uh, when I'm running classes at the gym, right? We're open every single evening, we're open all weekend long. 
And if I had something that was due, I could talk to Kurt or Tyson and be like, oh man, I have this paper due uh, tonight and they grab class. Do you know what I mean? So like without them, then I never would have made all these deadlines. And so yeah. I think without the people, without support people and some time management skills, it wouldn't have happened. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's a great thing to talk, but talk to me about like some people wouldn't even consider taking mm. on that much and you're you have your degree masters now in, in psychology or you have your doctorate oh master's. i have my masters in counseling psychology and then i have a ba and a ed from before so, so talk to me about coping strategies because outside of having a great support system in, in with uh, tyson and kurt and the rest of the guys out there um i i know a lot of guys that have put off having a family or have never opened a gym just because it seemed too much. Yet when we talk to you, you're like, um, I'm just going to do it all. And, and uh, it all kind of worked out in terms of coping strategy. How do you manage on three hours sleep? How do you decide to get things done? And what would be one or two or three of things you could talk, you could, you could tell someone or coach someone if they started to get overwhelmed um, and they were you're fearful of, of the activity level that they may be getting into. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, speaking to the support people, when we opened this gym, when we decided to do it, I knew that um, Dwayne Peters, Tyson Steele, and Kurt Souther were three guys I could rely on, right? The four of us opened the gym, and we've added coaches since then, uh, a number of them. And I know that those are people that we can rely on. It's all, it's all the people, right? Um, so I think that choosing who is going to be the people that you you start projects with is, is also a really good idea. Um, just just like with the modern fighting championships, right? I was going to start modern FC, you know, maybe all by myself, but I started with AJ Scales. He's done 13 shows and I was, I headlined his 13th one and the show was really well run. So I was like, okay, well, here's a person that I can rely on. We can make this thing happen, right? So I also, so I do think that it is important for you to kind of just be honest with yourself when you're analyzing you know, other people, right? Like deciding who to go with, you know, you can be like, well, I like this person, they're my friend, they're cool or, or whatever it might be. But, you know, are they someone that you can start something with and be successful with? Or are you going to be like stressed and then the two of you are going to stop being friends, right? And I knew that I could rely on these people. So that was really helpful. Um, Do you have an example of how you knew, how you, knew to, to, you could rely on them? Was there an instance where you're like, I don't know what to do and all of a sudden they came through at a high level, how do you know? How would how would how would someone judge? Hey, you know what? I like this guy, I like this guy, but this is the guy I got to go with. Is there an example of that at all? Or you know what? For me, I like to look at the things that they've accomplished. Right? Like like I knew that okay, AG's ran shows before, so there was a direct indicator that he could run another show, right? Um, and then I also looked at um, you know like Kurt Ties Dwayne. I've known for whew, we started training together in like oh oh six oh seven. So they like knew each other for almost 10 years by that time. And so I knew that like Dwayne, for instance, was a hardworking guy, like he has his own, runs his own business, gets all this sort of stuff done. So you can tell he's a go-getter and can get that kind of stuff done. And then I've seen Tyson Steele and Kurt Southern prepare for MMA fights like no other. And, you know, their diet, their training regimen, you know, all that sort of stuff and, and nailing it down. And, I, and they're smart, smart guys. And so you can just, you can tell if you, you know, it, it is difficult. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, it's difficult. But you can tell if you decide to, you know, not just say, okay, well, here's my buddy. You know, maybe me and my buddy should just go do this. You know, like, I don't know, just be honest with yourself if this is something that you're actually considering. Is it okay to go do that? Yeah. But if you're talking about doing lots of things, like, you know, running a, a business and doing degrees and families and MMA promotions all at the same time, then yeah, that is a big a number, you know, a large strategy. It seems like for sure. Yeah, it seems like would would you say that your life is very compartmentalized, or is it kind of like a big Venn diagram with everybody meeting in the middle? Um, the reason I ask that is because you know I'll have some friends in my life that will only I won't introduce them to this side, right? And I'll do projects with these guys, but they will never get to see these guys unless you know we're at a dinner and it's accidental. But they just do. You, do, you, mm -hmm. do you find that that works at all, or is it different? I don't think mine's like that. I think that I'm just super open with everybody. Like I just think that you know sometimes it can be overwhelming, but I'm just like no matter what's kind of going on, I'm just always sort of getting little pieces of everything done. 
So they're always like long-term projects that will pay off eventually. Like, yeah, I have this, this degree that'll be done in a few years, or I have this gym that's going to keep getting bigger over the years and just doing pieces all the time. So that everything, nothing's ever kind of idle. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm not going to just be like, all right, this is all gym time or this is all work time because I will be, you know, working on something and I'll get a message from the guys that I run the gym with and I'll answer some stuff. So you have to be careful with that because you don't want it to make it feel like you're just putting out fires all day. But I do like that I can just sort of look at little accomplishments all throughout. And then in the course of time, they kind of just add up. Mm. This is the, the main things that I think when you say that, oh, people like, oh, that sounds like a lot. I wouldn't even start that. Is I've been telling myself for a long time that if you just start something, like you're going to get it like, eventually. You know what I mean? Like people are like, oh, man, like I'd like to become a, a nurse or I'd like to become an optometrist, right? Or I'd like to, you know, if you, if you sign up and you just you just do it, like, you, you know, you do this thing, you do the test. Like before you know it, you're going to be like, Oh man, you know, where did, where did the time go? Four years are going to be by and it's going to be done. Right. So I think a lot of people just, if they just start, they're going to get it done because it's necessity, right? Necessity is the mother of invention. You're going to invent ways to get things done. Cause you're going to be like, I have a test coming up. I need to find time to study and you'll find that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, one of, one of my favorite conversations that you and I and AJ had was, uh, the morning after MFC won in Saskatoon <laughs> and talking about the, the spectacular fights and, and where we were in terms of uh, being a sellout and uh, succeeding. But we got talking about um, dieting and uh, we got talking about making weight. And uh, you guys started talking about there's no, there's, it's a difficult thing to deplete your body of water and food um, as you move up to it. And there's a whole bunch of other outside techniques you don't need to share here about how to get that done. Um, but the one thing that I was really interested in is that uh, I think you guys are like, yeah, I remember when I had to make weight and, uh, you know, it was really hard and your brain screaming at you. And then you are saying, yeah, I, had, I went back into torture techniques and how people survive torture. And I was like, what, what, sure. Adam, tell me, what are you talking about? How you used anti-torture techniques to, to make weight. And uh, I loved it. So do you mind sharing that? Uh, that well, was that one talking about counting backwards? Yeah. Oh, man, no, it's just, it's rough. Like, we didn't know how to cut weight as good as I can teach the guys now. I remember doing, you know, 13 pounds in a couple of hours in an afternoon or a few hours because you're supposed to cut as much as possible and, and as short as possible, as close to weigh-in time so that you gain it all back. And I remember it was just, man, it hurt. But you'd be like, if I can count backwards from 100, then, like, these last few minutes will almost be up. And they'd be like, no, no, I can, I can handle, like, 25 more. Well, I can handle like 10 more because you're just trying to distract yourself or you're like, like counting the drips as they fall off your head. And once I count to, you know, 30 drips, I'll be able to get out of here. No, I can handle counting 10 more of these things. So you're just like convincing yourself that you could go longer and longer in the, but it, you know, it was always in a dry sauna. I don't use those anymore. I think I have PTSD of saunas. I haven't been in one in quite a few years. <laughs> I don't go in those things ever, never, ever again. Um, I think that's what you mean. Yeah, yeah. No, it was, I just was like, I was so interested in that because I'm always like, we always get into tough situations. Heck, man, sometimes when I'm waiting in line, I, I start to have to tell backwards because I'm like, how long is this going to that's, uh, that's where my head gets it sometimes, but that's just me being impatient. Oh, uh, that's super fun. Yeah. Now I can do well, the stuff I need to get done, I guess. <laughs> oh, I hear you. Hey, I really appreciate you taking the time, Adam, and it's great to reconnect. And I and I I, I know we'll be working together in the, in the future on some more things. But one of the questions I always like to ask as I'm doing an interview with, and I found it very meaningful and powerful, is uh, to get a little bit further back in, in who Adam Lorenz is and uh, ask the question, you know, what might be one of the greatest lessons that one of your parents, either your mother or your father, uh, taught you growing up that's helped you become who you are today? Ooh, yeah, that's a big question um, because I think my parents have taught me a lot of lessons. Um, it's interesting because like, and I'll be candid like this with, with young clients. I'll be like, I, you know, I, I was raised with 
an awesome family environment. My parents have supported me my whole life and they still do on everything, right? So so I don't so much, you know, connect with other people because it's like, oh yeah, you know, I know what that's like because, you know, I had this happen or I had that happen, but I didn't have to experience any of that stuff. So that's all stuff that I've just had to, you know, learn through, you know, experience of talking with other people who have had hard experiences and stuff like that. So I've literally been taught a lot of really meaningful lessons. Um, however, like my father is for sure the hardest working person I've ever met. Um, and like just the other, you know, just the other day talking to my mother, like we were talking about, you know, like he had to miss lots of things, right? Like lots of stuff. He, him, uh, the two of them have never missed me compete in the ring. That's for sure. They'll come anywhere. Um, <laughs> mom doesn't cry through them anymore. I think she watches most of the time. Like uh, <laughs> yeah, I think she still might cry during them, but um, <laughs> but he did all of it so that he could, you know, give his family a better life, right? Um, so he's been just working, you know, blue collar style since he was much younger than me. You know, since he was a teenager, you know, 15, 16 years old, he started working. And he's, he, I remember he was always gone before I even got up to go to school and he always got home super late. And, uh, and I think he worked pretty much every day. <laughs> and so it was just doing all that hard work, but then he was still home every night. Right. So he was, he still made it home every night and we knew he was always there to support us and stuff like that. And like, he never, I remember hearing a story one time from my mother about how he was going to go do like uh, a job that would take you away. And then he saw like a family having a supper together and he was like, yeah, that's not happening or breakfast together or whatever. Yeah. And so he always stayed in our hometown and worked hard, harder than I work now. But he did teach me that you can get a lot done if you do it, right? Like if you, if you get up and, and do your work, you can get your work done and be successful and, and give things to your family, right? Um, because, you know, how else are you going to get? He always used to say like, why put off to tomorrow what you can do today? And I was always like, yeah, no, it should be more like, why do today what I can put up to tomorrow? Come on. But no, he was right. You got to get stuff done when, when it comes. And then you can actually, you know, get lots of, you know, gain some accomplishments. And yeah. Well, I think Apple doesn't far too fall from the tree, far from the tree when you talk about the amount of things that you've achieved in the last, you know, five to 10 years and the amount of work that you're doing and still being able to like, that's an amazing statement to make about your father saying, you know what, he was there when it mattered and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then times that were important. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And still being able to be that role model that, that you knew growing up and uh, to have you go and uh, sort of role model it. It seems to be, like I said, maybe genetic trait, but it's, uh, yeah. I don't know. I think I had to take on like four projects just equal to hours used to put into, you know, one job. <laughs> uh, that's crazy. Hey, listen, thank you for that. Uh, before we get going, um, let's talk real quick. Like you've taken a lot of guys uh, at your club from civilian to fighter, for example, um, whether they're doing amateurs or pros or whatever. Talk to me about like the two or three or four things that you look for when you see someone that comes to you and says, hey, uh, I think I wanna do this as a career. Um, what are you looking for? What are you gonna go, hey, this isn't, you're not ready or the, you don't have the talent the, the talent to do it, don't waste your time. Would you ever say that? Or um, how do you know, yeah, you're ready. Let's, let's, let's start moving you forward. You know what, I think you have to give everybody a chance because you'd be surprised, right? Um, so everyone, everyone should have a chance, but, you know, before they start, you know, sparring with the other pros or something like that, they just need to show up to class and do the training. Um, so if someone shows up and they've never trained in their life and they say, Hey, I want to become a pro fighter and join your gym. It's kind of, well, you know, hold up, hold up. <laughs> it's not that easy. Right. Like, yeah, I'd like to see them train for a while and then maybe start adding themselves, you know, joining the, you know, the sparring sessions and stuff when they can handle themselves and when like not just handle themselves as in like not get beat up by everybody, but have control where they're not going to injure people by accident. Right? right. Like not wild and out of control where I have someone getting ready for fights and accidentally cut them with a, you know, crazy flailing elbow or something. But when they can actually have, you know, the offensive and defensive control over themselves, 
then they can start sparring. So I think that it's that it's important to let people know, like, you know, it's not a sport where we're just going to jump in. Like, if you just walk out in the field and say, hey, I want to be in the NFL, you're going to have to do some football practices. Sorry, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I think that is probably the first thing that I, I, I would say that I would need to see. And then after that, they're going to have to be, I don't know, just self-aware of where their skills are at. Right. Or else as coaches, we're just going to have to be straight with them because you don't want to send someone in that's not prepared because, you know, like a couple of people, you know, a couple of people passed away fighting last year. Yeah. Like I can straight up tell people at my gym, like this isn't a sport to fool around with. You should absolutely be prepared to, for the sport to compete in the sport, in the sport. Mm -hmm. I was, I was there. I, I coached a match last year where a guy died after a yeah. boxing. Yeah. Uh, so it it's, doesn't get many more, you know, any realer than that. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's uh, you definitely have to um, take it very seriously because there is, I mean, in anything in life, but this is a, this is, this is a fight and uh, you never know the, you know, the capability or the resiliency of the human body. Sometimes it can go through anything and other times it'll just crumble and you don't know. So that's, t that's, uh, that's tough. Um, but you're right. So, so you're saying in order to figure out someone's ready, they got to show up at class. They got to get into sparring. They got to be able to control so they're not hurting anybody else, or they be able to manage their emotions or or their strikes so they're not hurting their training partners who are trying to make them better. And uh, and is that is that about it? You know what? They're, well, that's like the start of it. Um, at my club, we have well, I've just implemented this. Um, but there is going to be some baseline testing involved. I don't think anyone else is doing this, to be honest. I can't. No one that I know of is doing this, but <clears throat> I started thinking about it, and I was like, um, after David Whittem passed away, that was who uh, my my fighter, Gary Copas, beat for the Canadian Cruiserweight title out in, uh, out in Fredericton. Um, David went into a coma after, and then he passed away You know, quite a few months later. And I thought about it and I said, well, you know, why would that happen? Well, maybe he had, a, you know, a lot of repeated, you know, head trauma, right? It's possible. Maybe by no one has record. He's been knocked out, a, you know, a few times, quite a few times. And, but then also, you know, perhaps in the gym as well, right? And I started thinking, okay, well, those ones that are on his record, I guess the athletic commission can suspend you and all that sort of stuff. But who's phoning me and saying, hey, Adam, like, how many guys got knocked out in your gym today or this week or this year or anything like that? I said, nobody. No one's ever came to ask me if my guys are training safely and if they're okay, yeah. right? I need to get knocked out on Monday and come back Tuesday if I let them. Um, we been very careful about any sort of head injuries. I can absolutely say 100% nobody in the modern martial arts center has ever been knocked out within our facility. It's never happened hmm. because we, we instill every single time we spar i don't care if it gets old but you'll hear coach kurt or myself say hey guys remember it's not to the death prepare you know take care of your training partners and they'll take care of you you know we make sure that there's no one's getting knocked out in our gym it's not happening because that's just that's not good for fighting you don't get knocked out and weaken your chin and you know <laughs> it'll shorten your life that doesn't help any um but then i said no one's doing that so I actually had a talk with my, you know, soon to be, hopefully very soon to be provisional supervisor. Um, she's a registered psychologist that I'll be working underneath. And she was like, you should go talk to some of at the sports services places, right? So she gave me one in particular. So I went to go speak with him and his wife that, that run the business. And I said, yeah, well, I said, you know, a couple of guys have died and I want to make sure my guys are safe and I'm running a promotion now. And, you know, it's becoming even more, you know, important to me that all these guys are, are safe, you know, as, as a coach and just, you know, as a person, I want to make sure that everyone's, you know, safe. And they suggested that we should baseline test guys. And if you haven't been knocked out in the last few months, then you're, you're available to the test. And so all of my people that want to compete in, whether it's Muay Thai or MMA, anything where you're going to take head trauma, they're going to get baseline tested. And if they do get rattled in the gym somehow or in a fight, they're going to get retested by the agency and they will be responsible for sending them back into training. 
because I think guys get their head rattled and then they say, coach, oh, hey, the coach asked them, how are you feeling today? Yeah, I'm feeling good, right? Okay, well, cool. Let's train some more, you know, a week later, whatever, a month later. I don't care what it, what the time frame is. Or a guy gets knocked out in a fight and they say, all right, well, you're suspended for the next 60 days, right? But is that enough? I don't know. I'm not trained. I'm not a neurologist, right? Um, so I think that it's important that they get retested and that a professional tells them it's not up to the athlete or the coach that way. Yeah, so what you're saying is at, at Modern Martial Arts Center is that you're you're focusing on uh, concussion impact and you're making sure that guys are in the best shape before they go and compete at the highest level. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So I want them to be in shape quickly yeah. in the gym. And I'll talk to them about emotions, about anxiety and stuff like that. If anyone wants to know anything, like that's one of my main things I like to talk about is anxiety, the amygdala and all that different crazy stuff. And so mentally, physically, make sure that they're okay. Yeah. Talk to me. And I mean, I want to step back for a second because I remember hearing about um, Gary Copes' fight. And, uh, and he was amazing in his conversation or his statement to the press after where he was very uh, apologetic and he dedicated his life to fighting for both of um himself and the person who passed away and i thought that was an amazing moment um to have there but um and it's an unfortunate sort of thing it doesn't happen as often as is what well, we don't ever want it to happen but yeah. in terms of how do you how do you find people dealing with death and i mean gary seemed to have a really it was tough but he seemed to have a really positive outlook on it um have you ever had to, you know, in that situation, did he need any extra coaching on that? Or, uh, you know, it seems to me that I've never been in that situation, super unique. And when you think about it, you're like, oh, my goodness, I don't even know what someone to go through. Talk to me a little bit about you being at that event, um, finding out, and then how Gary dealt with it. I think it's important that when anyone has to deal with anything, that there's someone that's, under, you know, someone understands. Someone's empathetic to the situation. If that happened and, you know, no one could get it, like I can understand it and be like, well, you know, what? I, I coached that match. Like this sucks. Right. And so, you know, both of us, you know, Kurt and myself and Gary, all three of us like that, you know, doesn't sit well with us. This is really unfortunate. But between the three of us, you know, we can be empathetic towards each other and knowing that, you know, that this makes us sad. It has it brings negative feelings, you know, that are involved. Um, so that is helpful to have just the Gary can know that there's other people that understand that, that he's also going through a rough thing as well. Right. Um, and then, you know, and then it's just being very aware of what it is, right? Like what, what actually happened? He competed in a boxing match that was put together by a promotion, by a commission that had medicals and it had a ref, all that stuff. It was just like every other time he's been in the ring and there's no, it's none of it's his fault, right? He wasn't responsible for any of the pre, you know, the, any sort of anything that man has sustained before that he wasn't responsible for his safety during the match. They had both signed up to compete in a boxing match. So if you can actually, it's, you know, it's not easy, but if he can, you know, understand and I, and I believe he does that exactly what the situation is, it's not so much of, you know, you know, we had this fight and this happened. It was that all these kind of safety parameters were put together, all the sanctioning, everything that is just like every other UFC fight or NFL game, right? They yeah. go in the field and they play each other on Sunday and that's what they do. If someone rams heads together and someone gets, a, you know, gets injured, that's, they were doing what they've signed up for and what they love to do, you know. And that's kind of the way it is when you, you know, look at exactly what the situation is. And I think that's important because otherwise you're just putting a whole lot on yourself. And I don't think, I don't believe that you should. It is good to feel sad about what happened. Um, and, if you, and if you didn't, I think that would be really inhu inhuman, right? So I think it's just in us to feel upset about the situation like that. But we also shouldn't blame ourselves if, you know, give ourselves more guilt than what we should be.
Yeah, well, I mean, just accepting the responsibility to go on and fight for both of you, the way that Gary and, and you guys sort of came over, the way that he thought about it, I was like, you couldn't have asked for a better response. He, you know, he was just like, you know what, man, that sucks, and uh, I fight for both of us now. I was like, that's I've never heard anything. He's still for, doing it. Yeah. Dude, raising money. There's a steak night in a few weeks. He's got yeah. he's going. He talks to people. He talks to kids. He's helping coach some inner city youth and he chats with them. He's doing lots of things actually. And yeah. I brought in this concussion thing. Like we're trying to make an impact, right? To make sure that things like that don't happen again or even, you know, just lessen the risks. Yeah. Yeah. And the risk is real. I mean, people don't realize that um, they're like, oh, well, real fighters won't do that. And you're like, well, there's guys like Matt Fedler who, uh, who had one great, uh, MMA fight with us and looked like future is so bright for him. And he's like, and he said, no, I don't think I'm going to fight anymore. And I'm like, why not? He says, I think I'm going to go into politics, which he did. And he's continuing to do well. At, but he, he was like, because of concussions. And when you hear the hear real horror stories of it and the degenerative damage that happens because of those, um, it stopped him from having a probably pretty interesting career moving forward. But what you're doing is going, hey, listen, uh, you don't have to stop. Um, we're going to manage it and we're going to keep you as safe as possible. And I think that what you guys are doing around concussions and managing that, because I know I've had a couple training um, in the past and uh, you you can't make a good decision after you've had a concussion. You're just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Like you don't, so you, someone else has to sort of take over and go, no, no, come sit down for a second and, and let's just relax for a bit. Um, and I think you're doing it from a scientific and data based uh, place. I think you guys are, are doing a really good job. Hey, listen, we've got a little bit over time and I love talking to you, Adam, so it's so much fun. But uh, talk to me about um, where, if there's any beginners out there, uh, a little bit about your club, when they can do beginners classes and uh, and um, that type of thing, and then we'll, we'll close her down. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, at the modern oh, I think you're thinking, of, I can hear myself speaking back at me. No problem. Just finish it up. There you go. Yeah, I hear it good now. Um, <clears throat> at the Modern Martial Arts Center, uh, we have a whole pile of classes. We have classes, you know, 6 a.m. We have classes at noon. We have classes all evening. We have classes on weekends. There's a whole bunch of training times. And the best thing to do when you, if you want to join a gym is you come down and you try it out. I always tell everyone that comes in, they're like, oh, hey, like, you know, how can I sign up? Should I, try? I tell them, try it out first. Make sure you like it. I say, don't you try it out once. So you try it out once, you might be like, oh, I love this. And then the second time you're like, okay, maybe I actually don't. And then you wasted, you know, your money signing up for the month. Or you might come in and say, oh, man, like that was kind of awkward. Like jujitsu is kind of weird. Got, people are laying on me and stuff like that. But then you, you understand it a little bit better. And then you start to, you know, okay, maybe that wasn't so bad. I do like it better. So I always tell people come down and try it out a couple times and see how you like it. Number one, um, we're number 20 at 1100 7th Ave North. So we're right down by the river, kind of very central in Saskatoon. And our Facebook page is super easy to find, Modern Martial Arts Center, and it's got a schedule on it. Our Instagram, MMA Center, and Twitter, MMA Center, it's all very easy to find. And you can send us a message. And uh, our, our website as well, MMA Center has a website as well that you could easily find on Google. Send us a message, and we'll say, you know what? Come on down at you know any pretty much any time. <laughs> Um, but come down one evening and try it out or just or just watch and see what you think. And you know what? If you want to try the gym out, you want to try some other gyms out, go ahead. That's fine. In fact, if you want to join our gym and still, you know, sometimes go other places, oh, I'm going to go to this city and train a little bit or go over there, that's fine too because I'm very confident in the fact that our atmosphere at our gym and our coaches and just, just everyone, our members are just amazing. And I'm just super confident that, you know, people join up, they're going to love it there. And um, that's all I wanted to do is try it out and see if they can fall in love with martial arts. <laughs> yeah, it's a great it's a great mentality to have and motto. So that's Adam Lorenz from uh, Modern Martial Arts Center. I'm looking forward to MFC2, hopefully uh, in the next 18 months, my friend. Thanks so much for taking the time, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you very much, sir. Have a great day.